Today on The Grave Talks, a conversation about Colonial Williamsburg, the history and the hauntings, with the historian of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, Kelly Brennan. Williamsburg, Virginia has a long history. Before it was Williamsburg, it was known as Middle Plantation, an unincorporated town founded in 1632. In 1699, it changed its name to Williamsburg. In 1932, Colonial Williamsburg opened its first public exhibition building. The site spans over 300 acres and includes 89 original buildings dating back to the 18th and 19th centuries. It is also home to some residents you can't see, ghosts. It's said that some of them date back to the 1700s. I'm Carol Hughes, and on this episode of The Grave Talks, a conversation about the history and hauntings of Colonial Williamsburg with Kelly Brennan, historian of Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, where her research fields of expertise include sex, death, magic, ghosts, mental health, and crime and punishment. Kelly, I think with that resume, I could probably talk to you all day long. (laughs) (laughs) And when we talk about that, with your fields of expertise, that really is historical. Mm -hmm. It's the history of sex, death, ghosts. And so that there's like a hundred episodes right there (laughs) and all of that. (laughs) But let's start with Williamsburg today in the history of the city. I find it so interesting. I live in Kansas. We didn't even become a state until 1861. My city wasn't even a town until 1890. So when we talk about, a town that was basically founded unincorporated in 1632 and became Williamsburg in 1699. That's a city with some history. Yeah. I mean, this is about as close as you get in the United States to that kind of um, timeline chronology in terms of a city. And when you think back, you know, this goes revolutionary history, pre-revolutionary history, Civil War history. It really has all of it in this one mm-hmm. city. Yes. And, and that's, I think, one of the things that makes the city so special is that we have all of those different pieces in terms of past lived experiences. Now, we focus, of course, on the 18th century, uh, but there is a recognition of you know the importance of of the Civil War in the 19th century, and of course the pro- the process of the Restoration. This was that was something that had never been done before. So Williamsburg had some very famous residents. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson studied law under George With. Um, basically, these are guys, a lot of these big names served in the House of Burgesses, which is the lower house of the um, government of the legislature. Uh, And because of that, we had some really amazing people come through. And even if you kind of push the timeline slightly, George Wythe also educated John Marshall, the first chief justice of the Supreme Court. So you have a lot of really, quote unquote, heavy hitters who spent time, important time in the city. In a way to preserve the history of the city, which I think is so wonderful, in 1932, Colonial Williamsburg opened its first public exhibition building Now, this has spanned a really big area, and it's a wonderful site to go learn about the history of Williamsburg, kind of step, like literally step back in time. Describe what that's like. For guests or for staff? Because I can answer both. Let's say first for guests, like if I was to go. I think one of the things that guests marvel at is how big the place is and how many different aspects of 18th century life we talk about here. Um, one of the things when I worked in costume, and, and I'm not going to focus on this part, when I talked to guests, especially guests who had children who didn't want to be there, I'd say, what are you interested in? And I said, you can say anything. Tell me anything you're interested in. And from there, we could build a, an, a, an itinerary for the day that would take the, it would hit the interest of, you know, these sometimes these teenagers who don't like anything. How are you able to restore or somehow get 89 original buildings. That to me is very fascinating. A lot of places you go to like this, they'll have some original buildings, but not 89. I think part of that is it was a living and breathing town for a long, long time. I mean, leading up to the restoration. So I think part of it was these were people's homes. So, you know, they, they kept living in them. Um, one of the things that people will talk about with the Battle of Williamsburg is how many of the 18th century buildings were destroyed for firewood 
So in some ways, we're very lucky that we have as many as we do. And in other ways, it's not terribly surprising because all of these spaces continue to be inhabited um, through the course of the 18th and 19th into, into the 20th century. Are you originally from Williamsburg? No, I'm from New Jersey. Oh, so I thought maybe you had a connection to Williamsburg, which is what got you interested in the city. I do. I did my PhD at the College of William and Mary. There you and go. Had, yeah, there you go. That's how I got down here. And <laughs> and I didn't know that William and Mary was across the street from Colonial Williamsburg when I got here. And then you're right across the street from it. And you're thinking, yep. I'm kind of drawn to this place as well. I had a background in uh, interpretation. Like as a kid, I was a junior interpreter in a site in New Jersey. I continued to, you know, give tours a, a variety of places through college. So coming here, it was like, oh, I need a, I need a little more money than what my stipend is <laughs> providing. I'm going to work for Colonial Williamsburg, and I'm going to do it as a frontline staff member and interpreter. We do museum theater. So what people are seeing is taken from. Act, you know, actual primary sources and sort of created sort of script work around that. We have some people who are um, always in first person. So to them, it's always, you know, whatever year it's supposed to be and they have an identity. Um, the rest of the staff, so we have people who uh, who give tours of the buildings. We have people who sort of assist, assist guests uh, and they, they kind of sit outside in front of the buildings. What did you call that theater the term you just used. Oh, museum theater. Museum theater. I like that term. So one thing that really drew me to Colonial Williamsburg was that I've heard of hauntings. And so I looked at the website and you do tours in the evenings mm -hmm. to where you can actually go into these buildings. And you have some really interesting buildings on site there at Colonial Williamsburg. And I want to start with the Peyton Randolph House that's actually what even drew me into Colonial Williamsburg. I came across an article. It said it was one of the most haunted houses in the United States, whether that's true or not. I never know how you gauge that. If, if it said it's one of the most haunted, then I figure it's pretty haunted. But it has a very interesting history. So it's one of these things that the first part of the building is one of the oldest buildings in town. It was built in 1715. And like I said, they don't move to 1699. And it's a process to get people building on these sites. So the fact that there is part of the building from seven, sorry, seven, 1715 is unusual. Because at that point, I mean, the powder magazine, which was a military stronghold, the church, all these other things were not completed yet. And yet this man, uh, Sir John Randolph, decided to build his house on that site. And it's a good size house too. Well, it starts as a much smaller building. And then what happens is Peyton Randolph builds on it in 1757. Like he adds this very grand um, dining room, an additional sort of bedroom space upstairs. Um, and that's 1754 because because a decision had been made, uh, there had been a fire in 1747 at the Capitol building, and they for a long time hemmed and hawed about should they move the Capitol. And they decided not to. So what happens is there's this huge um, building boom throughout the town. And when we've got these really rich and powerful guys, guys like Peyton Randolph, they decide to add these sort of very large, very grand um, spaces in their homes. So it starts small and very sort of modest, but it grows, especially when we get into this period, you know, the time period that we talk about at Colonial Williamsburg. And it was at one time a Civil War hospital? It was. Not only was it a Civil War hospital, it was also a Revolutionary War hospital. Oh, wow. Yeah, it had both. So a, talk about a place that's been traumatized. Add to that the fact that you had, at the time of Peyton Randolph's death, 27 enslaved people on that property. So we're really just adding trauma to trauma to trauma. I think one of the things we always have to remember, though, is that death on domestic properties in the 18th and 19th century was not unusual at all. What makes Peyton Randolph special is just the, I mean, the sheer volume over time. And then you get into the 19th century. You have two little girls, uh, the daughters of the, of, uh, the Peachy family, who die on the same day. Oh. In... 
We don't know why it could have been illness. They could have gotten sick. They could have, um, there could have been an accident. We don't know. So we have that and the, sort of, you know, the family trauma of this, uh, we have in the period after them, we have a man named Richard Hansford, who was known as a, who was a slaver. So who knows what, what it would be associated with him and the site. Are there any spirits that people identify as a certain person? I know it's hard to say this is the ghost of, but sometimes you might have an idea or there might mm-hmm. be someone who seems to be playful and you attribute it that to a little girl mm-hmm. or something. What have you heard? So the answer to that is basically every piece you can think of. People have seen who are probably the Randolphs because when they're seen, they're wearing sort of 18th century clothes that are of the period when they were alive. Uh, people here, the two little girls, or ostensibly the two little girls. Um, so there's a very playful energy there. Um, a lot of it has, uh, it, the house is associated with a lot of negativity. As you can imagine, you got trauma upon trauma. And we've gotten all kinds of interesting reports from guests on these tours. And I used to run that program. I actually was a storyteller for Colonial Williamsburg for 15 years. And I told ghost stories. Um, One of the things that I was told was that there was what's known as a vortex in the basement of the Randolph house. Basically in which the woman who explained it to me was basically it's a, it's a bus stop for all kinds of unpleasant, nasty, potentially evil creatures, ghosts, what what have you, to travel back and forth between dimensions and other parts of the, of the globe. So when you hear things like that, I mean, it just kind of gives you another variety and instance of the different types of hauntings we know of. And different people seem to have different relationships with the property. I, I Nothing ever messed with me. And I have, I have seen things like I couldn't explain. I've heard things I couldn't explain in the past. That property does not mess with me. Uh, I had staff members who every time they went on that property, something spooky happened. So part of it is the, this is so strange, the personality of the people of the past are ghosts and the personalities of the people who give the ghost tours, who come on the tours, that kind of thing. Do you think, because you have, this is something that you've studied um, mm-hmm. And I don't know if you've studied this particular thing I'm getting ready to ask you. Do you think that sometimes it's kind of you walk in and you have a lot of confidence? You're very kind of maybe you're a don't mess with me sort of personality. And then maybe some of the other tour guides are a little bit, they're not as protected against the spirits as you yes. might be. Do you think that comes into play? Yes, I do. Especially when I had, and I'd have staff come back and report to me things you know they grew up that when at the end of the day invariably if something happened on a tour you know you came you come back and you talk about whatever that was and people would have instances where they'd be like yeah the house felt spooky tonight and people would say somebody saw something on my tour and you know then there'd be someone like me where nothing bothers me but someone else may see something um so it really does different ghosts like different people <laughs> As strange as that sounds, uh, I had a guest on a tour years ago who said to me that she can't, quote, see them, but she can hear them. And I said, OK, what did they say? She said, they like you. I said, why? They, she, she said, could you tell their story accurately? She said, they don't like. And, she, and what she said to me was they named storytellers by name. They didn't like them and made that very clear. I get that. Like you're in there trying to accurately tell the story. And they're hearing it and appreciating that. They have respect for that. Where someone else who's kind of just saying things that didn't really happen, I could see why that would be annoying to them. I mean, yeah, because that's the thing is if they are sentient, they have not lost their personalities. They love the things they love. They hate the things they hate. It's just, you know, they're quote unquote living their afterlife. <laughs> you know, the living thing is their though, best they have, afterlife. Yes, they're living their best. Well, not all of them. <laughs> well, that's true. Well, it does have the vortex in the basement. Have you been into the basement and been in that area? Do you feel really dark down there? It's funny because what I would, what we would do when we got new storytellers, we take them into all of the spaces where the stories took place to give them a, a real sense of sort of the geography of the story. And one of the places we would take them is down to the Peyton Randolph basement, which is not an interesting looking space at all. It's an old break room. You know what I mean? It's got, it's just got stuff in it. There's nothing exciting about it, but 
I can't tell you how many times I would take staff down there and they would say, I feel this really nasty pull. There's a bad energy, that kind of thing. Now I'm going to guess yes to the answer of my next question, but have you had guides who think they can give these ghost tours and then after a night or two, be like this is so not for me. Usually takes a little longer than like a night or two, but they will, the people who will really suffer or struggle. And what I found more than people quitting, people who are exceptionally sensitive had to come up with ways to sort of protect themselves in these spaces. And those who figured it out still do the program. Those who couldn't, they end up leaving. But usually that's not the only reason they leave. But when you think about the Peyton Randolph house, like I read there were suicides in the home. And then when you think about the slavery and how people were mistreated in the home, all kinds of different emotions over the years, it, I can see why that house is haunted. Why wouldn't it be haunted? Mm-hmm. Uh, the suicide thing we're still trying to fully verify. I mean, I know that it's out there on the internet, but the you know the historians here are trying to fully figure that part out. Um, but you're right. Why wouldn't there be? It's, it would be impossible for this house not to be haunted, even without a vortex in the basement. <laughs> all that <laughs> that just a, adds to it. Yeah, all that and a vortex in the basement. Is that house on its original property? Are any of were any of these eighty nine buildings moved to? to- of them were. One is actually up towards one end of town. Uh, and they, which and they said at that point after they did it, they're like, we're not going to do that again because it came from Newport News, which is a city pretty close by. We just moved the Bray School, which was a, a school for ensla- enslaved people and free black people uh, to learn to read and write. So, and then we moved that because physically it was on the campus of the College of William and Mary, but Colonial Williamsburg wants to be able to share that story with the public. So we moved it and we moved it to a site that's right next to the First Baptist Church. Uh, We're doing the excavation now that's eventually going to be rebuilt. Now with 89 buildings, I would imagine that a lot of them have that heavy, dark, haunted feeling to them. Maybe not all of them, you know, some of them might have a lighter feeling, but I would just guess that there's a lot of them that have some sort of hauntings. Obviously, we can't talk about all of them today, even mm-hmm. though that would be fun. But the other one, I, there's a couple other things I do want to ask you about. The George With House. Mm-hmm. And George With, and once again, correct me if I'm wrong, but he um, signed the Declaration of Independence. Yep. That's the kind of history we're talking about when we talk about Williamsburg. Tell yeah. me a little bit about the George Wythe house. So the thing about, so Wythe is a tremendously interesting man because in addition to signing the Declaration of Independence, he taught Thomas Jefferson law. He taught John Marshall law. Um, and these, these guys would actually stay with him as, you know, part of their education. They, you know, they need to live somewhere. So they stayed with, they stayed with him. So I know when people get all excited about this idea of this declaration, you know, this declaration signer, you've got the whole added element is that in that space, you have, you know, the conversation, the process of him teaching law to to some of these guys, Mm -hmm. uh, which is sort of exciting. Um, The house itself is built about 1750 and he didn't own the house. It actually belonged to his wife's family. And the deal basically was, if they had kids, the the kids would inherit the house. If there are no children, it would revert back to the Tol- the Tolliver family, um, which was her family uh, name. The interesting thing too, so not only do you have that history, we have the story of uh, Doctor Goodwin, who was one of the was actually the driving force in the creation of Colonial Williamsburg. And we know in 1926, he used the upstairs of the with house as sort of his uh, offices because he was also the rector of the Bruton Parish Church, which is right next door. And there's a lot of history in this in this one home. Again, just like the the Peyton Randolph house. I also read that it was headquarters at one time to Mm -hmm. George Washington in the siege of Yorktown. Yep. So you I think forgot about, to mention that one. Yes. Yeah, that was just a little, just a side note. <laughs> but when you hear that kind of history in this one home and the people who would have gone in and out of there, and then I would imagine built in the 1750s, it has had a lot, its share of 
trauma and because I I'm assuming 1750s also slaveholders. Mm-hmm. All the way through 1865. So there would have been a lot of trauma in this house as well. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. What have you heard about the house as far as some of the things that happened in it? Oh, so one of the things I need to warn you about with the stories is I told these stories. I heard these stories firsthand. So when you say, tell me something, I have to think very carefully. <laughs> uh, one of the things I will say actually about the width in terms of both ghosts and history is an 18, sorry, 18, 1932, uh, when Colonial Williamsburg was beginning to open, there was a short story written about a woman that they identified as Lady Skipwith. And in the story, Lady Skipwith uh, lives in the Payton Randolph, not Payton Randolph, the With House, and she attends a ball and she gets angry because she's an fiery Scotswoman and she breaks her shoe. She goes into her house and she became a ghost and she basically walked around with one stocking foot and one shoe. That is the story that was told in 1932. The story evolved to what it looks like now. And that is much more dramatic. Uh, essentially, I mean, I can tell you the story the way I used to tell the story, or I, I can would, just tell the story, whichever you'd like. I would love to hear the story the way you always told it. Okay. Give me a second. <laughs> I have to like I have to like put myself at the right place in the story. Okay. I saw something at the With House years and years ago. But to tell the story of what I saw, I have to tell you what I think is one of the worst ghost stories in the world. And I said, do you want to hear it? And the group would say, yeah. And I tell it pretty quickly. And I would say very grandly uh, the, the, in the way the story went, I'd say, uh, Lady Skipwith lived in the with house. The answer is she did not. Uh, Henry Skipwith and his wife move in in the 1790s. Lady Skipwith never lived in this house. And Lady Skipwith went up to a ball up to the palace, which of course she never lived there. And the actual Skipwiths don't move in until the palace had burned down for nine years. She got into a terrible fight with her husband. She ran down Palace Green where she lost one of her shoes and she bust through the front door. She ran up the stairs where she hanged herself, where she was pushed or she caught fire. It doesn't matter. None of it's real. And that's the way that the story would start because that was, that was the thing that we'd have to sort of introduce. And we've done research with the uh, haunted Williamsburg staff have done this um, demonstrating all the ways that the story is not only incorrect and accurate, it's impossible. So it's one of these things with that site, but people see a lady in blue. And the connection that's always been made is that the lady in blue is Lady Skipwith. But what you see also in this story is that she eventually, the lady in blue eventually gets attributed to uh, Mrs. With, uh, Elizabeth With, who dies fairly, fairly young. Um, So that became the story. And then there were other stories where people would talk about seeing her in mirrors and feeling comforted by her or, you know, seeing her in a room, that kind of thing. Uh, and she apparently, like the other ghosts, r- maintained a personality. And we learned through guests who were mediums and the like that she did not like me at all. And that became sort of the running joke. And actually, that got worked into people's stories that she has a personality and she has an opinion. Which, which is kind of cool. And which makes me think she was the lady of the house. Yes. Because... I, me too. And actually everyone says that, that that's the real vibe that comes off of her. I think it's really interesting. The Peyton Randolph house, those spirits respect and like you. This woman, not so much. No, not at all. Maybe you're too loud to her. Maybe you're too mm. not ladylike enough for her. I don't know. I you and I have never met. But you know what I mean? <laughs> you might have qualities that she finds aren't feminine enough. Who knows? But yeah. and it's kind of like in real life, that's how we are. You could be polite mm-hmm. to somebody but be like, I don't really like him. Yep. And that goes back to the, what we were just t- talking about in terms of the personality of the spirit and the personality of the storyteller. Uh, I had storytellers who loved the with house, felt so safe, so comfortable. And they had all of the qualities that a lady of the house in the 18th century you'd expect to have. 
So it makes sense. Now there's another spirit in the with house that does seem to like me. Oh, um, so his name, this is Dr. Goodwin. I mentioned earlier, who is the driving force between me uh, on the creation of colonial Williamsburg. He is seen, uh, on the second floor guests complain that he's very rude because he doesn't pay attention to them. Uh, people have smelled and I did smell this once and I can't explain why, uh, actually I smelled it twice. Pipe tobacco. Very clearly pipe tobacco. It has a very distinct smell. Yes, it does. And there is no smoking anywhere near this building. I mean, anywhere near this building. You have to smoke in the middle of the street if you're going to smoke. You can't have smoke on Colonial Williamsburg property. But I realized looking back, when I would, when I actually told a, ver- a terrible ver- <laughs> of a lady skip with story inside the building, uh, I had nights where I was I was teaching at the time, William and Mary, and I'd have nights where I'd be grading in between programs, which is pretty brutal. But I would hear footsteps come, you know, come down to me, stop, look into the room, see what I'm doing, and walk away. And anytime I was doing anything remotely scholarly, he seemed to show up. Oh, maybe that's why she didn't like you. You were too educated for her, and she fa- she finds that intimidating. Oh, I like that idea. I like that. I like that. I don't think it's true, but I really like it. But it's nice to think, you know, because in her day, nice she wouldn't have had that opportunity. Maybe she's a little jealous that you did. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it could be it could be a million things. The one we always go with is that I'm loud and rude and disruptive. And <laughs> she does because I'm it. loud and rude and disruptive inside her house. I could see that being annoying. Yeah, I could see um, that. So at the with house, yeah. are there two spirits that? are pretty active or do th- do you also think there are more there? We know that there are more there. We think there are more there. I should say, um, there is a man wearing military clothing, uh, 18th century military programming who is in one of the rooms on the first is seen on one of the rooms on the first floor. And he doesn't really do anything. He kind of stands there. Uh, but we associate him because of the nature of his uniform with when it was, um, Washington's headquarters. Other than that, I'm sure there are other ones, but those are the, really the big three that we have guests see on the regular. And I think it's interesting when you have three very different spirits living in one house. Do you suppose yeah. they know each other? Do they see each other? Do they know the uh, other ones there? I don't know, but they're very different I actually different spirits. asked a medium about that. Oh, let's hear. What did the yeah, medium she did. Say? So what she said was, we're actually at the Peyton Randolph house. She said, uh, most of them are aware of each other. The ones that are strong enough are aware of each other. She goes, some of them don't. She said, the, the Randolphs, you know, the original Randolphs who lived in the house, I hope I should say Peyton and Betsy. She said, they show up and they look down at, on everyone else, but that was their social station in life. You know, of the other people who live in their house later did not certainly have that pedigree. So it's not terribly surprising that if that's the case, and they're aware of everybody else, they'd kind of keep them at arm's length. So for them to have this sort of disdain, uh, the medium said that the little girls aren't really aware of anything else, but they kind of know there's things there. Uh, she said Hansford probably is aware is she's pretty sure is aware of what's around him. And that's one of the things that they say is sometimes they say that ghosts don't see each other for whatever reason. And that wraps up part one of our conversation with Kelly Brennan about Colonial Williamsburg. Make sure you listen to the next episode. We'll talk about the haunted taverns and you will hear one of the best ghost stories I think I have ever heard. For more information on Colonial Williamsburg, go to colonialwilliamsburg.org. If you'd like access to all of our episodes, including the archive and advance episodes, everything commercial free, become a gravekeeper. You can sign up on Apple Podcasts, try it for three days free. You can go to patreon.com slash the Grave Talks, find everything there. Also, all ad free. And for all of us at the Grave Talks, I'm Carol Hughes, and thank you for listening. <laughs>